The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, welcome everybody to Coffee with Kalefi. I'm uh, Bob Hot Rod Roar, going to be your presenter today, and I happen to be up in uh, Iowa City, Iowa, at Plumber Supply in a borrowed office. So hopefully all the technology uh, stays with me here, and the phones don't start ringing, or I'm going to have to start taking orders for the uh, for the counter here. But uh, thanks everybody for tuning in today, and. Uh, as usual, we've got a lot to talk about, a lot of good uh, new information I think will be interesting to you. So I'm going to go through a, uh, the Cluffy Hydronics. Um, the information I'm going to talk about today, a lot of it comes out of the uh, number 18 there that we did on water quality, what, about a year ago now, in 16. We did that. Um, you can see some of our back issues. Uh, 21 will be hitting the streets here mid-year again. Um, so if you aren't getting those, go to our website right there and sign up, and we'll get you on the mailing list and make sure... Um, twice a year when we mail those out that you get one uh, delivered right to your mailbox. And uh, if you want some of the back issues, get a hold of us and let us know. We do have some of those um, around that we can fill up a binder for you and get you some of the back issues. So, so where we kind of left off last time, what we had hoped to do is kind of pick up a little bit on the difference in the way that you can treat water. I'm going to go over some of the, uh, the different tools that we have available that you can get out there to test the water, the main things that you want to look for, whether you're going to put um, you know, regular fill water from the job site into your jobs, or if you want to blend some glycols, or if you want to put some conditioners, or if you're going to use some cleaners on your systems. There's just a couple instruments that you should own, that you need to own, that you can check the water and get a, a pretty good idea of where you're starting from. And then you need to uh, determine, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to clean up my water? Do I want to buy water? Do I want to haul water to the job? Uh, what do I have to do? So we're going to go through the steps that you need to do that and um, the tools. Uh, I also want to look at some of the standards that have de developed in other countries for water quality. Uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria have actually uh, gone ahead and developed water quality standards. And then what I really want to get to that we haven't gotten to uh, in previous is the um, some of the chemicals that are out there, what they do, do I need to use them at all, when do I use them, and also glycol, because I understand that a lot of people out there um, are using glycol in their systems and I'm in Iowa and all this week I've been talking to a lot of geo people up here and they're using glycol mixes in their geo loop fields also in addition to uh, glycol and other fluids. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the pros and cons to uh, the different fluids that are out there and how you test them and how you put them in and how you use them. So again that's a uh, that's a mouthful that we're going to we're going to be uh, having here today. The other thing I want to say, and I, I just discovered this this morning as I was researching, getting ready for this, that this is actually the seventh time that we've talked about water, fluid quality, and hydronic systems. So if you go back to our archives, you can go all the way back to February in 2013. Uh, Jeff Persons came on as a guest speaker for us, and he owns uh, Geosource One over in Columbus, Ohio, and he happens to be a hydrogeologist, and he's been on the RPA. He's got a textbook out there called... Um, understanding geothermal systems, and he came and did a great presentation specifically towards you geothermal guys. You know, what's happening to systems out there? What do I look at for water quality? What are the key factors when you start doing a loop field and stuff like that? So if you want, go back and, you know, listen to that one again. Then in April 2015, Jim Paling from First Supply Company, you folks up in the Wisconsin probably know the name First Supply. Jim's one of the owners of First Supply, and he also does training on boilers and water uh, quality. And he has a, a deep background in boilers. He used to work for Kwani Boiler Company years ago. So he's worked on big commercial and industrial boilers. And uh, he did a great presentation for us. And he got into it a little bit deeper. He's got a little bit more background in that than I do. I'm not gonna present myself as an expert by any means on water quality, but we've had over the years, um, We've had Jeff on here. We've had Jim on here. Uh, we had Kevin O'Connor back in June of 2015 from Dow Corporation and he did uh, uh, heat transfer fluids. He's a, a senior engineer over there. So that was a good webinar that was specifically to glycol. And uh, I tried to squeeze him a little bit for some trade secrets, but his, uh, his legal department wouldn't let him disclose exactly what goes into their fluids. But he did give us some really good uh, information and insight. So uh, that's another one to review. And then uh, uh, John Siegenthaler came and did another one. And um, when was that? March of 2016, when we came out with the hydronics issue, which Siggy helped us put a lot of those together. So he did a presentation on uh, um, water quality for hydronic systems in, uh, in March of 16. That's, of course, on the archive. And then our fearless leader, Mark Olson, up in uh, Wisconsin there, who's tuned in today and is going to be my, uh, my lifeline if I need one. Uh, he did a webinar, we called it Digging Deeper, and he actually went into it, you know, what is pH, what does it mean, how do you adjust it? He went into it a little bit deeper than we have in the past, so that one is probably the most 
uh, in-depth look that we uh, that we took, and then uh, of course we tried this in February again, which we called fluid quality. So we've gone through this material a couple times. I hope it's not too uh, uh, repetitive and it gets boring for you. But the reason that is such interest to me is, you know, I've been involved in this industry for what over 30 years now, and I've always had an interest in water and fluid quality. But when I went to work for Kalapa here about what nine years ago now, I guess. Um, I kind of renewed my interest and I got deeper into the research and learning more about it because I started seeing products coming back to us that had, you know, problems that they had seized up or bound up or plugged up or had pinholes in them. And I said, all this gets back to water quality again. I got to learn more about this. So I, I'm on a quest and I don't know if I'll ever be an expert, but I'm, I'm going to keep learning. I want to keep sharing what I found about it and why it's become more important in this day and age for us is the high efficiency equipment that we're installing nowadays, whether it's a high efficiency pump or high efficiency modcon boiler, you know, we've got a lot more metals in our systems that we ever had. The wall thicknesses are getting thinner and thinner all the time. I mean, I cut away some of these modcon boilers and it's a few thousands of an inch of metal that's between that water and the flame side. So um, it just becomes more important that you know what you're putting in these systems because the uh, warranty and the longevity of that piece of equipment is directly related to what you put in there. So as we look at water in this bubble, I don't know how well it shows up on your screen, but it's in our hydronics uh, uh, 18 when you get a chance to look at that. It basically shows what's in untreated water. So this would be the water that's coming out of your well or your public water system in the city where you live. And within that bubble of water there that you're seeing on the screen, let me get my little pointer going here, you'll see all these different uh, minerals that are in there, dissolved minerals. Um, and you'll notice that we try and uh, show by the different color of these minerals that are in there. Some of these will have a positive charge and some of them will have a negative charge. So all the different minerals that are in there will either be a cation or anion, cation being a positively charged mineral and a negatively charged would be an anion. And so if we want to take everything that's in this bubble, which we do, because we don't want any minerals in our boiler system at all, because some of them will scale out and cause um, you know, issues with hot spots in the boilers. Uh, some of them will plug up the equipment and stuff. So ideally, we'd like to get everything that's in this bubble stripped out of there and end up with just pure water, which is H2O. So probably the most common thing that people think of when we say, well, we got to you know, clean up our water, get the minerals out of is a water softener. And so basically what we do with a water softener is there's a resin bed in there and we run this water through there and the resin that's in there has little beads that have a charge uh, etched to them. Uh, they're kind of little polymer beads. They can actually be, uh, you can find them in nature. It's called zeolite and it's actually where lava rock, hot lava hits the salt water, forms a, a little uh, mineral known as zeolite. But they now, most of it's manufactured. They can make it out of polymers and stuff like that. And so these little porous beads are going to collect anything that's got the opposite charge. So all these little brown dots in here, when it goes through that resin bed, that zeolite resin bed and that water softener, these are going to be attracted or they're going to be pulled out of the water and they're going to be attracted to the beads inside there. And then when those beads get um, uh, plugged up or get all the minerals attracted to them, what we do is we take a brine solution out of the other tank on your water softener, we put salt in there and make a brine solution, and we wash that through this resin bed, and what it's going to do is it's going to exchange the sodium ion, which is coming from the brine solution, for the hardness ion that's been attracted to these beads, and then it replenishes the resin bed so you can use it over and over again. So the good news is we've taken away a lot of these calcium, uh, magnesium type of minerals that are our line scale forming that cause those deposits that you see in the bottom of a water heater when you take it out or you see it in the boiler that's had a lot of water added to it. We handle a lot of that, but we've left behind some of these other um, charged ions that are in that water, sometimes referred to as salts. And so we fixed one kind of bad thing that we don't want, which is the scaling minerals. But now by adding all these other sodium ions in there, we've increased the conductivity of the water. And when we have high conductivity water, that still leads to problems with corrosion, problems to aggressive water. So I, now I need to deal with the rest of the things that were left over in that bubble. So we got a little bit better with softening. We fixed some things, but we kind of made some things worse in that we increased the conductivity of the water by putting those um, sodium mines in there during the exchange process. So what I really want to get to is this little bubble right over here. I want to get to H2O is what I'd like to end up with, which is pure water. There's a number of ways I can do that. I can run this water through a reverse osmosis process where we squeeze that water through a semi-permeable membrane under high pressure and it's going to strip out everything in there and then that backwashes down the drain. 
I could run it through a distiller, which I boil the water, turn it into steam, collect the condensate, drip it off into a, a container, and now I've got pure water. Or I can run it through a resin bed that's got both positive and, and negatively charged um, resin beads in it. So it's going to attract everything that's in that bubble. So I end up with pure water. So which one do you want to use? What's the better way to go? Well, there is no exact answer to that. A lot depends on how bad the water that you're putting into there is when you start out because every one of these has a you know a positive and negative uh, effect to the water and i want to end up with water that's not too expensive to do i want to end up with water that doesn't take you know days to create like ro water on a small ro unit can take you all day long to get five gallons of water that's not going to be very practical on a job site so um, I'll show you what uh, Kleppi's answer to that is and what we think is uh, one of the better ways of doing it as we go. We've got a demineralizer that can get you this water on the job site that you can take with you from job to job and just clean up your water. Because I want that, that pure water, whether I'm going to put just straight water in my system, if I'm going to blend um, you know, glycols to put in my system, if for some reason you're still using methanol or ethanol in your uh, uh, geo loops, for example, I want to blend all those chemicals with good water so I don't destroy the, the inhibitors and the different components within those. So we'll talk about that when we get down to glycols, but I think that's a pretty good uh, example. So what I need to know when I look at the sample of water on your job site is I'd like to know the hardness of the water. And I bet most of the plumbers that are tuned in today probably have water hardness test kits. It's just a little dropper kit to do that. I would also like to know the TDS of the water that stands for total dissolved solids. So that's all the minerals in the water. In addition to the ones that you can test with a hardness test kit, it's gonna tell me everything that's in there. Now it won't tell me exactly how many are chlorides or how many are calcium or how many, uh, what the different types of minerals are, but it's gonna give me, um, you know, the total amount of solids in there. And then the other thing I'd like to know is the pH of the water. You know, is it acid-based water? Is it going to the alkalinity side? Because that's going to affect some of my components in the system also. So <clears throat> I guess I'll start out with a poll question because I kind of want to get a feeling to what you already know out there, what y'all are doing out there already. Are you chesting water? So what I'm going to ask you here, if you're using now, I'm saying like a public water system, um, do you think that whatever they're treating that water with back at the water de department is adequate to put it into a hydronic system? And I'm going to give you a, a minute here to say, yep, I always trust the water that they're giving me is adequate or not or never. And um, yes, if the, you know, the report from the, uh, the city says that it's adequate to use, because what you want to match that up with is, and I'll show you here in a minute, what the boiler manufacturers are giving you for water spec needs to match up with what you're putting in there. So what he's going to run this for a, for a couple seconds here and we'll kind of get a feeling to uh to see what you're what you assume is going on there with the water you're putting in there so what you're going to find is that in the public water systems you know the epa regulates a little bit about what they have to test for and uh, what the levels can be but they're not trying to make water that's good for a boiler and for a hydronic system necessarily they're trying to make water that's safe to drink that's safe to use for bathing and stuff like that so it's it's not always going to be the best water for what you're doing so uh so there we have it. I, I'm glad to see that always isn't the majority vote there. Uh, sometimes never. Hmm. Uh, and yes, if the uh, if the city report is matches up with what the boiler spec is. So interesting. Well, let me give you some more information to help you make a better decision there because I think you should be paying uh, a little bit more attention to that. And it also does affect our components. You know, a lot of the components that we make at Cloppy can be used for domestic water. They're low lead compliant uh, valves. So here's an example of a zone valve that got shipped back to us and it was used on a domestic water system. And you can see the lime scale from whatever was in the water that was flowing through this uh, zone valve is actually, um, you know, it's sticking to the brass there. The good news here is that since we use a peroxide cured EPDM paddle in there, we didn't have a buildup on the paddle and that valve, uh, even though that the flapper was starting to bind up a little bit from the minerals that were building up around it here. The flapper didn't have a buildup on it when it's open and it was still, you know, closing off, but it got sent back to us and they said, well, is this something coming out of your brass? Is your brass breaking down here? Is this a, a you know, a defect or a flaw in your component? And uh, of course, no, the answer is it's, it's you. It's the water that you've been putting through there and probably the temperature of the water going through there that causes those minerals to precipitate out. So, you know, as a manufacturer, we're going to do the best we can to put components inside our mixing valves, inside our zone valves 
that are uh, aren't going to you know scale up that the lime scale won't stick to we'll use polymers we'll use different types of uh, in this case an epdm that's been treated so that we don't get the scaling and the mineral buildup on that but the brass itself is still going to be uh, susceptible to that lime scale so it doesn't, uh, that's not something that the water company is fixing for you. That water could have come out of a, you know, maybe Chicago, I forgot where that came from, but that might be the water that's actually coming out of your, uh, your pipes and your faucets. They're not going to take that hardness out of there for you. That's something that you're going to have to uh, examine and address. So let me show you some of the tools that I use. And interesting, I, I went through Jim Paling's uh, presentation this morning to get uh, prepared, and he's got almost exactly the same tools that I use. And uh, in his slide, he actually put on there, he had about, I think, $166 invested in all the tools that he uses to check water. And uh, by the way, they sell about 2,500 boilers a year over there at First Supply. So he's got a lot of hands-on experience on what does and doesn't work and what you need to know about. So um, again, that's the... Uh, the answers are in the test kit here. So this is a test kit that we offer from Cloughy right now. And this little meter is interesting in that it does both, uh, it'll measure the TDS of the fluid as well as the pH. So you get kind of two in one. And it comes in this little carrying case here. It actually goes in this box first, kind of like a Russian nesting dial. That box goes in this box and it, um, obviously the directions on how to drive it. But it also has these little packages of fluids that you can recalibrate it because when you start using test instruments, occasionally you want to gonna, gonna want to put them in a fluid and recalibrate them, and make sure they're reading accurately. Because you've got a meter that's reading off a couple percent, then that's not going to give you, uh, you know, uh, the right information. So with, included in this kit are some samples that you can adjust the pH, make sure the pH is reading. So typically you do that at three different ranges: at seven, ten, and at a low range. So you can see a four, seven, and ten. Uh, fluid that's been adjusted to that pH so then you test stick your meter in that and adjust your meter to read that and the same thing with the TDS over here there's packages so you can recalibrate it so it's a pretty nice meter and that it has uh, everything in there in there to uh, to recalibrate it so I said you know what since there's room in that box I found that you could just take your pocket knife or an exacto knife and cut out the the foam that's in there and so what I've done is I put my water hardness test kit which is these three um, solutions that you drop in there and then I also put my uh, meter that reads my glycol percentage my refractometer and so everything I need to test for pH, to test for the hardness of the water with the dropper kit as well as the TDS meter are all in one uh, one carrying case. So when I walk in, I've got everything in there. And again, that's exactly what Jim has on his desk back there in Wisconsin when he does water uh, testing for his customers when they come in there. So we'll go through each one of those individually and uh, show you how they work as we go here. But that's really the kit. Now, certainly there's a lot more to know about water than what this kit here is going to tell you. And it, there comes a point in time when you're going to want to send a sample off to an expert and, and analyze if you've got a specific uh, issue with water. Maybe there's arsenic in it or lead or something like that. Um, I can't test for that with this kit that takes a little bit more equipment and a little bit more uh, sophistication than what you can probably carry on the job site with you. But this is going to get you in the ballpark. If you know all the things that these meters are telling you, you're going to have a pretty trouble-free system. Again, you got to go back, you know, every year or two and confirm that those, uh, that water, those chemicals or that glycol you put in are staying at that range that you put it in there. So, Here's an example of uh, how you drive a TDS meter. You basically turn the button on and you uh, it'll ask you if you want to read in the US or English or metric units. A couple of things you have to do to set it up when you take it out of the box. Um, <clears throat> Calibrate it for the temperature and stuff like that. But uh, there it is in this example here. You just uh, get a sample of water in a uh, glass or a plastic container like that and just stick it in there. And so on the business end of a TDS meter, what you'll see is this little porous glass bulb, and that's where it reads the, the pH of the fluid is read through that device there. And these two little stainless steel prongs just go in there. And basically what you're looking at there is an ohm meter. It's just reading the, the resistance or the conductivity, I guess is the opposite of resistance is conductivity. It's reading the conductivity of the water across these two prongs as you stick it in there. So you just click on the button there, read the pH. The nice thing about this meter, it also has an ATC, which is an automatic temperature compensation built into it. So it's critical that the temperature of the water when you test it is, I think, what do they say, about 68 degrees to get an accurate reading on your TDS. The temperature does have an effect on that. This meter will compensate for that if you've got water that's a little warmer or colder than 68 to F. The meter will calibrate that and make sure that the reading that you get is um, adjusted with the temperature correction. 
And then again, if you switch the button here, you can read the, the pH of the, the fluid also and the temperature it reads, always reads the temperature. So by knowing the conductivity of the water, that's gonna tell us a couple things. The more minerals, the more stuff that's in your water, the higher the conductivity of the water, the higher the TDS, the higher the conductivity, the more potential for corrosion because now that water can um, carry enough current that you can get uh, galvanitic corrosion. You've basically got a battery formed in your system. If you've got high conductivity, you've got mixed metals like copper or iron or steel or zinc and something, those metals are gonna respond or react to one another based on the conductivity of that water. So if we strip all that stuff out of the water and get it down to a very low TDS, we're not gonna have issues with galvanitic corrosion. We're not gonna have lime scaling. We're not gonna have our glycol breaking down. It's gonna fix all the problems that you're seeing out there with your water if you just you know, number one, check it. Number two, run it through a device that you can pull it down there. So there's just a little closer view of the um, of the different scales when you read it with the uh, pH measurement on the top. <clears throat> Excuse me, the the temperature and the pH of that water there is at the seven pH, and then on the bottom it's reading the the uh, conductivity. It does it for some reason. You go out of range, it will tell you that, and it'll jump up to another scale instead of reading parts per million. It'll go up to parts per b. So uh, just read the directions when you get it. So you say, I got a really weird reading on my meter. Well, it might've jumped up because you went off the range of the scale and it jumped up to a different uh, a measurement. So um, always good to read the directions when you set it up the first time so you understand. It'll usually give you an error if it's if it's changed and gone to a different thing. It might say, uh, what does it say? I think it says OR for un over range or something like that. And it'll tell you, okay, I'm, I'm switching gears here just so you know, and don't get confused by the reading. So. And if you have if you have a question with that, you know Kevin's really good at that. I, I've got a little experience with setting the uh, the meter up and troubleshooting it. So just call us if you have a question or have uh, trouble with the reading. So as usual, the Europeans seem to be a couple steps ahead of us on water quality. They already realize that this is getting to be a bigger problem than it uh, has been in the past. So they're developing uh, standards, and probably the most comprehensive one that I've seen when you go to these different websites is this German VDI standard. And VDI is actually the engineering association in Germany. It's kind of the equivalent of our ASHRAE group here in the US is VDI. And actually, I think there's 150,000 members in that VDI group. And I think ASHRAE here is about 50,000 members. So it's a pretty big uh, brain trust of engineers that have been working on developing these standards and saying, okay, what do we need to test for and how do we do it? So um, when you have a minute, look through those different standards because we're thinking this uh, European, especially this German uh, VDI 2035 is the standard that we should really be considering uh, for the US. You know, um, something that we should look at is what um, all the different things that they want you to look at for the water, how they test that and what the results are. Uh, again, when you get a chance, go and download that and read through it because there's some really good information and I applaud them for putting it in there understandably because sometimes when you get into water chemistry, it gets into some pretty big terms and if you don't have a degree in chemistry, you start to get lost in the uh, in the mix there. But you can see over here on the uh, on the right on some of the things they're talking about, you know, cavitation, erosion, uh, lime scale coating. We understand what those things are and what problems they cause in our system. So it, re it relates directly to what we do in our business. It's not something to say, well, this was in you know built for some other industry and we're trying to morph it over. No, this is exactly what you need to know about the water that we're putting in our system. So. One of the things of interest in there is they, they're the opinion, and again, there's various opinions out there on, you know, how you would fix your water. If you, the Germans are the opinion that you should fix the water before you put it into your boiler, your chiller, your solar system, whatever, that they seem, and I tend to agree with this, that if you run the water through a, some sort of filtration device before you put it in there, if it's got high TDS or a lot of hardness in, you're gonna end up with a system that you really don't need to do much more to. If the water is good in there and it's compatible with all the metals in the system and it meets the, um, the spec of the boiler manufacturing, you should be fine with just putting that good water in there. The other side, the other opinion that's out there is, well, no, you should put a chemical in the water because that will fix some of the things that could go wrong with your water. It'll give you some other you know, components like film providers and stuff like that. But as you can see, we kind of highlighted this here that they're really the opinion that if you put in good water that's been filtered through a you know, demineralizer, a, um, reverse osmosis or something like that, that's really all you should need to do to that water and everything in that system should uh, be fine as far as compatibility. You won't have any scaling, you won't lose performance, you won't have uh, pinholing and stuff like that. So 
I want to offer both sides of the story. I want to show you some of the things towards the end here that, you know, the chemicals as far as cleaners and inhibitors and inhibited glycol, why they do that and what some of the benefits of doing that. But again, if you get a chance, read through that standard and you'll learn quite a bit. Now, if you get to the point where you think you're getting in over your head and you're not quite sure, you know, that you're testing properly or that you're getting the right uh, results when you uh, use your test equipment, all the companies that manufacture um, chemicals out there, I happen to put Romar up there because I had this sheet in my desk, you can send them a sample. And here's an example over on the right on all the different uh, water sampling that they'll do for you based on how much you want to know about your water. So they've got a basic one that'll test the glycols. If you're doing a steam system, you want a little bit more information about the water that has to deal specifically with steam boilers, they can test for that. But as you can see, the price of testing varies based on how much you want to know about the water. So you can spend hundreds of dollars uh, breaking down water through all these different tests. But I would encourage you, if you've got a system where there's a lot of liability involved, like maybe a, um, a hospital or a university where there's a lot of big expensive equipment, that's going to be a big problem if it starts failing because of the water that you put in there. It might be wise to send a sample off to a professional like this and get a written analysis back and just keep that in the file somewhere or give it to that job site as a copy and say, okay, this is what we did when we put the system together. The water met all the quality specs of your equipment, of your um, engineering spec. And if something goes wrong down the line, if somebody's come in there after the fact and put chemicals in there or changed that water or added something to it, you're going to have to test that water and we want that documented. So that protects you, that protects the building owner, that protects everybody in the loop here, that the water was in fact analyzed for all the proper questions were asked, that it was treated to the right um, uh, conditions that you're using it for. Now you can get this from Fernox, you can get this from Romar, you can get this from Sentinel. I'll bet there's water uh, quality treatment companies local to where you are in the bigger cities pretty much have people that can do this. Sometimes universities can do that. Uh, I know some of the wholesalers that we do business with have labs in the back of their shop that they can do these type of tests and tell you what's going on with either your uh, your water, your glycol. So um, certainly you want to use that information. And here's an example of one of our wholesalers that um, <clears throat> was having problems with a job. He was getting pinholes in some uh, stainless steel boilers within a couple years of putting them in there. So we sent it off to a professional lab. And uh, this is kind of an example of what you might get back from a lab. Now, if you don't know what all these things are, that's a good time to ask those people, okay, why is this important? So basically what he's showing you here is he's giving you a little comment at the end, okay, these are the things that they felt were out of whack in the water that were causing your problems. And so uh, you can see the pH here is a little bit low. Why would the pH that low? Well, it did have some glycol in it at one point. And when that glycol goes bad, that's going to be your primary indicator that the glycol has been burned or overheated or the pH has been uh, a compromise because of a dirty fluid or something in that system and that's the note that he put on there why is the ph of the system so low if you're telling me this is just city fill water there's something else there's something going on with the system that um, you need to get to the bottom of so um, and again now it's documented so if something happened to the system again you can say okay this is the analysis that we had done and did you fix this ph determine why that happened and what you're going to do to buffer that back up and get it to an acceptable level so um, Again, the professional can help you with the analysis like that. So um, what we did is we just went to some of the different uh, boiler manufacturers out there. We went right to their website and we pulled off some of their um, water spec uh, information. So here's an example of one. And they're telling you um, the hardness needs to be below a certain level. Now, uh, the English unit there, we typically talk about grains per gallon when we're talking about hardness. Uh, you can convert that into parts per million if that's a language that you speak, or the metric unit would be uh, milligrams per liter there. But typically, we're going to talk about either grains per gallon or parts per million. I like that they put it in both uh, readings here. This happens to be a German company, so that's why it's in both uh, measurements there. And then they're going to tell you the pH range and a couple of the other things here. Um, Really the number that I want you to look at, of course, is the pH here. If they say keep it around seven, of course, you gotta adjust it or see what your water is. And again, the biggie right down here is this uh, total dissolved solids that you can check with our meter, the TDS of that fluid. Now these here, the zinc and some of these other things, no, I don't have a tester that can do that. That would have to go to a lab to do that. Why we're concerned about the dissolved gases in there, especially oxygen, that's what makes water aggressive for corrosion. And we're the opinion, if you use a good component like a Calepi uh, discal, uh, 
air separator, you're going to pull all those dissolved gases, both the air, the dissolved CO2 and oxygen out of there by just running it through a good air separation device, like a micro bubble type of device. So not so concerned about this number down here. Let me get my pointer back. But we do want you to fix this. We do want you to fix the pH. So what am I doing for time here? Yeah, I'm looking pretty good. And this one now, I, didn't, I know this is a little cluttered, and hopefully uh, you don't have to read through all of these, but what I'm trying to show here is I would hope that the boiler companies could all get on the same page, because here's what, one, two, three, four, five different boiler manufacturers, and if you notice here, you got one guy saying it's got to be between 5 and 15, the other guy's saying below 7, the other guy's saying between this and that. Uh, this one up here, he's got his pH between 6.6 .6 and 8. Uh, obviously, that 6.6 .6 isn't going to be very good in the aluminum boiler. So it's everybody's just got different numbers out there, and I don't understand, uh, number one, where they're getting these numbers from. Some of these TDS numbers seem way out of the ballpark. Uh, I don't know that they're copying each other. This guy's got 500 parts per million. The guy over here's got 1,000 parts per million. And I just pulled this off the uh, Internet. This is from, I think, uh, University of Kentucky somewhere, one of their dot .ed sites. And it shows you an indication of what's considered soft, slightly hard, moderately hard, and very hard water. And if you'll notice, down here, very hard water, one of these specs over here seems to be happy with that. One of these says between 5 and 15, and here they're saying anything over 10 is very hard water. So something's not, uh, something's not clear to me that why these specs are so, uh, so uh, different and why they're all over the board as far as what they're... Uh, what they're deeming acceptable water quality. Because if you put in one boiler and you got your water below seven grains, like this guy down here is saying, now you're fine, you got warranty coverage if something goes wrong with that. And they say, well, no, your water was too hard. You say, no, it's below seven grains like you told me. But then next week you go and use brand X over here and he's saying 15 grains. Well, now you're, you know, which is it? And you know, it's like two men say they're Jesus, one of them must be wrong. So um, I guess as a shout out to the boiler people that might be online today that you guys, it'd be nice if we could all get on the same page here. And I think looking at that German standard would be one way to do that because I think their numbers are right on. I think they've done enough uh, uh, research to come up with a good, uh, uh, you know, a defensible number there as far as the hardness and the TDS and the, uh, the pH of the water. So I want to, I'm trying to look at some of the questions that came in over the last couple of um, um, webinars to make sure that I've answered some of these past ones, stuff like that. And maybe before I go on, because I'm going to go into chemicals now, I want to get to the water. And one of the questions says, you know, is the water that comes out of the city good enough? It, can I just assume that if I'm using city water that it's adequate? And the answer, of course, is no. You don't know what the TDS of that water is until you test it. They might not be doing that. I've seen some water quality statements that come out that they'll, you know, have pH and others don't. They're, you know, they're just mainly going to test for the things that either the federal government or the state government tells them they have to. So you really should be doing your own testing and not trusting that what they say. Because as we learned from Flint, Michigan, the water that they're putting into the pipes at the treatment plant, by the time it gets to your faucet, it could be a completely different water if it's pulled some of the lead out of the old lead pipes because the biofilm has been scrubbed off. So what they're testing at the plant, what you're getting out of your faucet at the other end could be completely different. So we want you to test it at the final, uh, the final point of use there. Uh, another question came in as far as pH, um, can I use test strips? You know, I know some of the glycol people send out these pH test strips. The, the problem I have with that is it's just, the, it's just a round number. It's going to give you a pH of 7, 8, 9, or 10. It won't read in between like a 7.5, and if you don't have great eyesight, it's sometimes hard to see. Is it pink or is it red or is it orange? You know, where exactly I am? I, and, you know, again, for under 100 bucks, you can buy a good pH meter that's going to give you a good solid number instead of trying to interpolate between the different things because what's important to know about pH, when you go from a 7 to a 10 pH, for example, there's a tenfold change in the hydron uh, oxide in that. It's not just one number doesn't change a little bit. There's a pretty big jump about the quality of that water going from one pH from, from a 7 to an 8. So I want that number to be very accurate. And as you saw in those boiler specs, they're saying like 7.5 and 6.5 and stuff like that. You got to be pretty tight, especially on your aluminum boilers. You don't want to guesstimate that pH. So I would encourage you to get a meter that reads that out instead of using the test strip. So that was one of the... Uh, one of the questions, let's see um, what else I got on there. Um, <clears throat> well, let me, let's run another poll and that'll give me a time while this is running to read some, I got like pages of questions on my desk and I'll make sure that I'm hitting them all or as many as I can get to. But what, if you want to run this here, um, 
I guess you can just read through that, what the most important thing to on, ensure ongoing chemical performance is that uh, checking for the pH and TDS, I probably already answered this for you, the sludge and stuff like that. So let me uh, page you some of my stuff here. Um, <clears throat> Really, all these questions have to do with, you know, how do I measure it and what do I do if it's bad? So I think I'm answering pretty much every question on here. I'll get to some of the glycol ones as we get a little bit further in. But the only one that I came up with here that I couldn't really answer uh, very well for you is how do you measure dissolved oxygen? Well, that's something, it takes a pretty expensive meter. There's actually three different tests you can do for dissolved oxygen, but that's probably something that you're going to have, you know, a professional do. They're going to have the equipment to do and get an accurate number on that. But um other than that, as far as the hardness and the uh, pH and stuff like that, I think I've already shown you the, the meters that can do that. Now, once you start using inhibitors and chemicals, you're going to have to get a test kit from that company to measure that because now when you put stuff in the water, you're going to raise the TDS, the conductivity of that water. But if you're putting good minerals, uh, good um, chemicals in there, you might get a boost in your TDS, but it might be a good thing. So what did we come up with here on this uh, yeah, minimum, uh, minimize O2 ingress. Yeah, you certainly want to do that. Either you want to keep the oxygen from getting in there to begin with, or maybe put an oxygen scavenger like a sulfite or something in there that will absorb any oxygen that might be getting through the wall of your tubing or around your pump shield and stuff like that. Hey, Bob. Um, yeah. Um, this um, poll was actually intended for later when we talk about uh, antifreeze. All right. Um, okay. Switch so, it down a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but that's okay because... Uh, um, glycol is a, is, is a form of chemical, um, yeah. and, and maybe we can touch base upon the results of this poll about uh, antifreeze, um, if you want to comment on it, then we can back up and talk about the results that was shown in the previous slide about an earlier poll having to do with how to see if your chemicals in general are working okay, working yeah. properly. Yeah, and what I will say, I like on this one here that 41% of you are checking the refractometer, which is the, the freeze protection, because at the end of the day, you're buying glycol, so you don't freeze things. So it's good that people know that number and are checking that. So I'm encouraged that 41% of the uh, responses are checking that on there. So yeah, let's, uh, like I say, let's roll on through the chemicals and glycol, and then I think we'll... Uh, well, before we, maybe before we leave this, Bob, I, I think it was, um, it, this is very insightful because... Uh, you, you can, uh, for um, glycol, you want to make sure that the glycol does not end up becoming uh, exposed to too much oxygen because the glycol will, uh, with, with dissolved oxygen, it will tend to, to want to become acidic. And uh, each of the glycol manufacturers will state a range uh, above which they want that glycol to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, if it gets below that, um, your glycol is starting to become acidic. And, and losing its properties. So, yep. so it's good, uh, yeah, absolutely. You, the best way is to check the, the with the refractometer as everyone has, uh, most people have indicated here. Uh, the, and then a quick check is, is, your, is your pH within your specified range. Now, that, that's only a quick check. Your pH could be within your specified range, but if your glycol was mixed with water that had minerals in it, it might not change the pH, but as we learned from Jeff Persons, those minerals uh, will react with the uh, the glycol inhibitors, right. and uh, they'll come out of solution. So your your freeze protection drops, even though your pH looks like it's good. So yeah. so those are all these are all interesting points to look at from an antifreeze standpoint, and certainly the people at the top indicating minimize your oxygen ingress. So yeah, they know for sure that you got to keep that oxygen exposure to glycol to an absolute minimum. And that means a lot of things, including very good air separators. Yeah, and I'll build on that a little bit because that's excellent information. And, and one of the things that we've been told about glycol is that they're oxygen sponges. So if you leave glycol in an unsealed container or you happen to have it in an open vessel like some of the geo guys do with their pump stations, that oxygen is going into that glycol and it's going to break down that glycol. And the other thing that I've been told is you always want to have it in a UV protected uh, container too. Don't put it in a you know clear. I don't know where you get a clear container that big, but the UV will break it down also. And a lot of the chemicals that the water treatment plant are putting in there, like the phosphates and some of the stuff for turbidity and different things that they're treating for their water, will cause the glycols to, like Jeff Person said, it'll actually cause your glycols to gel. So you do want to fix the water that you're going to blend the glycol, unless you're buying pre-blended glycol that they use good water 
the water that you're mixing with that can from day one compromise that glycol can break down the inhibitors can actually start causing it to gel right out the get gate right out the gate so uh, that's what we're talking about you know you got to keep the o2 out of that system once you put the glycols in there and the same thing with the ph that's the biggest indicator when you got to replace your glycols I think Dow, when uh, um, Kevin Connor from Dow was on here, he said, you know, if you're getting into the low sevens, it's probably time to think about flushing that glycol out, cleaning your system with a cleaner and starting over because he, he said you've used up your inhibitors and it's going to be hard to put enough inhibitors back in that glycol to salvage it back to where it needs to be up into the, you know, probably the 8.59 to uh, 5 uh, pH uh, range is what typical new glycol is going to be. So uh, we talked about the refractometer for your freeze protection and then uh, – the other thing that breaks down glycol, probably the, the biggest thing that we are concerned with is when you start using it in solar thermal systems because that temperature up in those collectors can exceed, our collector can go up to about 344 degrees F on an 85 degree day. So that's that one down near the bottom there where we don't want to flash that, turn that to steam because we're going to overheat that glycol and break it down. And, and again, that will typically show up in a, uh, in a pH number also. So um, yeah, that's good. Let me uh, get back to... Uh, uh, to where I was here, because because I am going to talk about glycol more and talk more about uh, uh, those things. So one of the first, and I think one of the most important steps is when you put in a new system, you think about what's in that system. So you soldered copper pipe, so you got flux in there, which is, most of them have chlorides or ammonia or stuff like that as a cleaning agent. You've got oil in there. You might have piped open air. There's assembly lubes, and we you know when we put stuff together, cleffy, we use Loctite, and there's Loctite probably inside some of the things that we send out to you. We need to get all that stuff out there, and it, it sometimes takes more than just putting water in and flushing it out because to break those oils and some of those uh, assembly lubes that might be in your boilers and stuff like that, you kind of need a detergent or a soap or a cleaner. So I'm of the opinion that you want to fill up your system, uh, pressure test it. If you don't have a leak, just fill it with the, the water that's on the job site and put a cleaner in there. Put a detergent in there. You know, you can buy those cleaners from hydronic suppliers. Uh, years ago, we used to use TSP. It's kind of hard to find TSP anymore. That's uh, the phosphates have been taken out of it. But get a cleaner in there and make sure that you're starting out with a good, clean system before you put in glycols. Even before you put in good demineralized or deionized water, we want to get all that junk out of there because it's going to affect the, uh, you know, the, the corrosiveness or the pH of that water just from the stuff that you left behind. So if you've got an older system where you're taking out an old boiler and you notice there's a lot of lime scale when you start taking the pipes apart or you break apart the old boiler when you took it out of there and it's all scaled up, you might have to get a little bit more aggressive cleaner in there, something that's like a vinegar and acid-based cleaner to dissolve those minerals that are in there. A typical soap type of cleaner isn't going to go after those hard, thick layers of mineral deposits that might have built up in there. So if you see that in the system, and again, you can go to Hercules makes a product, Romar, Fernox, everybody makes a what they call a Scale-X type of product, and that's basically going to be an acid that will go after that hard-scale buildup and uh, dissolve it and wash it out of there. And then, like I said, the dirt and the sludge is going to be something that comes out with a uh, what's my time here with a, uh, uh, a soap-based cleaner. So the answer is, you know, uh, purge everything that's out of there, put the cleaner in there. Now, when one last uh, bit of advice, when you use a cleaner, you got to make sure you get all the cleaner flushed out of there before you put your good water in. And one of the best ways, and Jim Paling talked about this in his presentation, he said, check the TDS of the water coming out of there, and that's going to tell you if you got all the cleaners out before you put the good water. And he said, it takes a lot longer than you think to get all that stuff washed out of all the you know, the far extremes of your radiant loops and whatever might be in that building. So he said, you know, it takes sometimes, you know, hours to run enough water through there and make sure you got the cleaners flushed out before you put in your good water, before you put in your chemicals, your glycols or whatever you're going to use. So basically what the conditioners were going to do then, if you're going to go that route, is they're going to buffer your pH. So if your pH happens to be a little bit lower, a little bit high at the get-go, uh, you can get pH up, you can get pH up uh, or down boosters that'll boost that up. Uh, the oxygen scavengers are chemical. I think I know they're using different uh, oh, polymers, different chemicals these days. It used to be like a sulfide that we put in there. So it basically consumes or uses up any leftover oxygen that you didn't get purged out through the, um, you know, when you heated up your boiler and you got all your dissolved air out through your air purger. If there's any O2 left in there, we're going to scavenge that out. And then if there is a little bit of hardness, residual hardness from the water, one of the chemicals that are in those in, uh, corrosion inhibitors, it kind of, it's a, I think the word is flocculent, and it keeps those minerals in suspension. So instead of the minerals falling out of solution and scaling out, 
if you drain the water of a boiler that's got that type of chemical and you'll see ah, the water looks look really dirty and, and gray or brown colored well that's because of the chemical in there is keeping all those uh, deposits in solution so they don't scale out on the surfaces of your boiler and your heat exchangers and your pumps and stuff like that so they just kind of lock it up and keep it flowing through the system and I think the most important reason to use some of these uh, inhibitor chemicals is they have a film provider. So once you've stripped your metal down to bare copper and bare stainless steel with your cleaners, with your uh, chemical that you used, your soaps or your acids, what the film providers do is they get in there and they put like a micron thick layer of a film. It's almost like when you take a piece of aluminum and if you anodize aluminum, really what you're doing is you're rusting or corroding the aluminum, gives it a protective layer so it doesn't attack the metal below it like uh, lawn furniture, outboard motors are typically uh, anodized aluminum and just putting a film over the top layer of that and it protects it. So that's kind of what you're getting when you put um, uh, these inhibitor, uh, inhibitor chemicals. But now what you've got is you have to keep checking that. You have to go back every year, every couple years, and check that and make sure that you haven't used up or consumed these different ingredients that were put in there because then your water is going to go downhill on you again and become aggressive again. So basically what you've started now is a chemical romance. Once you put those in there, you got to go back. You got to check them from time to time. You might have to boost them. And in the case of glycol that gets really bad, you're going to have to take it out there and start over because you can't uh, fix it or salvage it. So just learn on uh, what you need to do to test that. And here's an example of some of the kits that are out there that make it easy for you to do both these steps. Uh, like the top one there, that Fernox, those are little aerosol cans with a little hose bib connection, and you just screw them onto your boiler drain or some hose connection on your system. Uh, some of our uh, our dirt cows have a hose connection on the bottom that you could squirt this fluid in there. So you put the cleaner in first, the first product, and you run that for you know a day or something like that, and then you flush that out. And see, they give you little uh, pH test strips there to make sure that you've got it um, flushed out. And then you squirt in the second chemical, which is your inhibitor, that has the uh, the film providers and all the other stuff. And you can see pretty much all the companies out there make it easy for you with these kits that have different you know quantities of them, depending on the uh, capacity of your system. If you want to buy gallons or five gallon containers of this for bigger jobs, uh, they're going to um, be able to help you with that. And this product down here from Sentinel is another example of a, uh, you know, a product that you'd have to have a little pump or some sort of injector to get it into the system. So um, obviously the directions on how to drive all that and stuff you want to pay attention to. And then here's just again an example of some of the different uh, inhibitors and chemicals that you can put in. You can see the, the pH down, the pH up. On the bottom right over here, this is more of an acid-based, uh, where's my little arrow, a uh, cleaner over here. If you've got a lot of lime scale buildup in there, you would put this in there to break down the scale. Uh, cleaners, inhibited glycols that you can buy. You'll find that most of the chemical companies that sell these chemicals also sell glycols. We sell glycol at Cluffy, and we had a special formula made out of a bio formula, and it happens to be a real high temperature glycol. We made it specifically for our solar system, so it's got a real high operating temperature, so we put a really good buffer package in it. It is aluminum friendly, and it is a high temperature because what you're going to see and what you're going to find is some of the new solar collectors now are based uh, or have aluminum waterways in them. So you better make sure that the fluids you put in there are aluminum friendly. If you get a new collector that um, used to be copper now has aluminum waterways, you got to have that tight pH glycol that's in there. So how do you get it in there? Well, I just showed you on that previous slide that uh, some of those are aerosol cans that you just, and I'll tell you, once you hook that up and pull the trigger in about five seconds, it's gone. So make sure you got it good and tight or it's going to be on your lap or on the floor instead of in the system. So make sure when you hook those up that you get a good tight connection on your uh, on your hose bib when you pull the trigger because it goes in quickly. And then uh, on bigger systems, you'll a lot of commercial buildings, you'll see these little pot feeders where you just take the lid off and you dump your chemical in there and then open a couple ball valves over here and it just flushes it out of the pot feeder into your system. You know, here's an example. If you got a radiator that's at a high point in your system, you could, I guess, put a little funnel like that. That must be from the UK probably. And you can just uh, pour the inhibitor, the chemicals in there, um, inject it. We also sell the uh, the hydrofill cart, which is a um, the hydro flush cart. I mean, it has a, a pump on it, so you could pump the fluid in there. You could run a cleaner through um, the system with our pump cart for a couple of days to clean out a system. <clears throat> uh, okay, where are we at here now? I guess we did have another poll. Um, I think I covered this already. Why would you put the chemicals in there? We're the opinion, like the VDI standard that I showed you, that I'd rather fix the water that I before I put it in there. But there are chemicals that, like I said, you can put in there that will keep the deposits in solution. If you've got, uh, you know, a lot of minerals in your water, um, 
you know, there's a fix for pretty much anything with chemicals these days, from the food that we eat to the water that we put in our boiler. But uh, this little poll here, you know, I guess we're asking you why you would use these chemicals. And I think, uh, again, we've, we've kind of given you reasons why you would or wouldn't want to use that. Um, I guess we want to run this, Woody, and see what we come up with for answers. Hey, Bob, this was the... Bob, this was a poll that we ran uh, last time. This is just the results to make any comments about the... Uh, oh, I see. Oh, I got my toolbars in the way. I'm hiding the results. I'm, okay, I see. There you go. Yep, I see the results now. All right, so 46% of people are already uh, looking at some kind of chemical uh, treatment. So, all right. Well, good information to know. Thanks. It's a lot more cost effective, like I said, to fix the water before you put in there than get in the system and try and clean it out and repair it and go back and, you know, uh, fix the harm that's been done to the system when you get lime scale and stuff in it. So, um, you know, start at day one and, you know, test your water and, and, and deal with it. Now, I will be honest with you, and there comes a point if your water has incredibly hard uh, water, like some of that I saw up in Saskatoon, there's a TDS that's off the scale at a thousand parts per million. There comes a point in time when it, it might be wiser to go and buy water from a professional company because if you, I saw companies up there that had RO units the size of a pickup truck, you know, they can sell you water cheaper than you could do it with a, uh, a you know, a, a card on the job site that's going to plug up after you put a couple hundred gallons through it because your, your water's crazy hard or, or super high TDS. So, you know, use common sense when you look at your water and say, well, am I going to completely use up the resin bags, you know, just getting through one system here. Uh, you know, again, go to a professional. What I found when I was up there in the, in Kent, up around that Saskatoon area, that most of the, the wholesalers up there already know what's in their water around there, and they already know what they need to do to fix it, and they admit that at some point you just send them down to the water treatment company with their barrel or with their with their tote, and they buy water that's been run through a big commercial RO or a deionizer and just take it along with you, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, simpler and more cost effective to do that. So. I think I talked about this a little bit about the purpose of the conditioners that, you know, we want to passivate the metal, we want to protect the metal, buffer it, scavenge it. Um, again, if you're using aluminum components, aluminum boiler, aluminum tubing in your job, uh, make sure that you're using the fluid that's specific to that. So I want to get to glycols because this I know is a big, uh, a lot of the questions that I got here in front of me have to do with glycol. So how am I doing for time here? I'm going to run a little late again. <laughs> Sorry about that. but. Um, we talked about this one. I think we ran this one a little bit earlier. That, uh, and I think we talked about this, Mark and I both, as far as um, all the points there. Uh, a couple of trivia things I put in there. It um, glycol in the in the raw form is used for a lot of food products and stuff like that. So it's not a you know an aggressive chemical by itself. But once you put inhibitors in there, and once you overheat glycol, you put bad water in with it, you do break down the the glycols, and that's when you start to see your pH numbers and stuff like that. Um, it's a thicker fluid to pump around through your system, so you're typically down there where I talk about viscosity, you're typically going to have to look at your pumping requirements when you use it in there. Uh, I talk about it uh, breaking down with the um, presence of oxygen if you put it in an open container. Um, this is interesting about glycol. They don't have a sharp freeze point. Like water, when you get it down to 32 degrees, it's going to freeze. Glycols, what they'll do first when you get down to their freeze point is they'll turn into a slush first, and the actually the slush will get thicker and thicker until it gets to a freeze burst point. So you got a little bit of wiggle room on those numbers. When you look at the freeze protection, there's going to be a point when you can no longer pump it, but it's not going to burst your pipes and cause a problem. So I guess my, uh, my bottom line is there, when you mix a percentage of glycol, don't mix a real strong percentage like 50 or 60 percent glycol in water. You don't need that low of a freeze protection rate. What you're really concerned about is the burst temperature on that fluid, not so much when it's getting to a slush where it's going to be uh, uh, hard to pump or won't pump at all, but you just don't want to start bursting pumps. I think uh, people think sometimes when they do a snow melt that they got to put a real strong solution of glycol because it could get below zero out there. Well, you know, you might lose your ability to pump it at a 30 degree below zero day, but it's not going to burst your pipe. So just, you know, pay attention to the, uh, the blend ratios when you do that. There's a ton of good information out on the website right now. This is a manual that you can download right at the dial site, and there's more things that, about glycol that you probably want to know in your lifetime. So if you want to get more into the uh, the chemical components and learn more about glycol, um, that's a good uh, reference there that's available. Um, 
a good, good example there. In fact, this is a slide that uh, Kevin Connor, when he did the presentation, that's why it's got the Dow logo on it. He said, be aware of your pump head. He said, also be aware of your expansion tank sizing with glycols because it, you know, 1.2 times bigger size of your expansion because of that uh, viscosity, that fluid when you heat it up and ex uh, expands. And this is a good point. And I've had this brought up to me a couple times that it's harder to get air. You can see in this picture over here. It's harder to get air out of glycol, and what the glycol manufacturers do is they actually put an anti-foaming agent in there as one of the ingredients in there because it tends to get uh, this little, uh, I don't know, frothy mix on it when you start putting it through a centrifugal pump. So, um, again, a cleppy discal does a good job of getting that out, but it might take a few days more um, longer than it does with just water in the system to make sure all that air is out of there. Um, we talked about the... Um, uh, the problem with that, of course, is it can cause your pumps to cavitate and stuff like that. So it takes a little bit more time. Uh, we feel that these are the best devices to get even this um, this kind of foam that you get on the top there when you start pumping that through a centrifugal pump. Uh, we're going to pull that out with our disc gals. Um, I don't know, again, I'm running out of time here, but this is just showing the example of a, a, a basic little residential system that had water into it, and the customer called and said, hey, listen, we're going to Florida this winter. We want you to come over and uh, winterize our, our hydronic system so it doesn't freeze, and just know that if you took that water out of this system here with a little five, uh, a five gallon per minute flow rate with a little, uh, you know, 48 watt, 46 uh, watt pump in there, by putting a 50% glycol solution there, it's going to take quite a bit more pumping power to move that system uh, fluid around there because of the, the viscosity of that fluid. So if you're changing a fluid, make sure that you uh, adjust your pumping power to be able to move that. Um, <clears throat> I think this uh, this down here gives you a pretty good example of the, if you're going to blend your own glycol, if you're going to buy straight glycol and blend it on the job site, here's the criteria. This, again, comes from one of the Dow spec sheets of what the water that you're using um, needs to meet if you're going to blend your own glycol. So they talk about the parts per million here on the chlorides. Again, you can read that with your TDS meter. Uh, they're breaking it down to all these different minerals, the sulfates and the chlorides. But again, a TDS meter that's reading below 100 parts per million on your water is going to be adequate water to blend that with. And they talk a little bit about the pH of the water and the um, uh, the dissolved metals and different things that are in your uh, <clears throat> in your water, and also when it's time to replace the fluids in your system if it gets outside of those ranges. There, um, it's time to flush that fluid out if your pH is dropping below that. Uh, I, I think Jeff Person uh, gave us these slides as an example of exactly what happens when you take good glycol and you mix it with um, uh, demineralized water. There's a steel wool sample that was put in there and after six months looks pretty good. And here's that same propylene glycol that was mixed with well water that probably had a lot of hardness or TDS in it. And you can see the difference between the uh, reaction of that steel wool and that fluid because of the, again, you didn't use a good quality water when you uh, built that glycol and it's starting to uh, break down that um, that fine steel wool in there. When you first put glycol in a system out of the box, it's going to look like this, depending on the brand, depending on the type of glycol. They all have different colors. Most of them are fluorescent color when you put them in there. Uh, if you go back a year later and it's got a coffee color to it, it's a good indication that you've destroyed that glycol. And two things are going to give you an indication of that is, number one, the color of the fluid, if it's a coffee colored, and also the smell of it. Um, it kind of, when you put it in, I have like a sweet, almost a sugary smell to it. When it breaks down, it gets this, I've heard people describe it as the cross between a, a men's locker room and a, and a um, cotton candy. It's still got a little bit of a sweet smell to it, but it's got a, mess, a musty, old, stinky smell to it. That's, uh, you know, again, put your meter in it, but that will be an indication just from your nose that that glycol has been, uh, been destroyed and it's time to think about cleaning it and flushing it out of there. <clears throat> So here's what I want you to do. I want you to pressure test. I think I talked about this. I want you to fill and pressurize. I want you to circulate a cleaner through there on an old dirty system. I want you to flush it out until the TDS of the fluid coming out of it matches the fluid that uh, you're putting into it. And then uh, either put your glyco in the system, either pre-blend it or mix it on the job site with good water. And then what I want you to do when you leave that job is put a sticker on that boiler on that system somewhere and put a note on what you did. You know, I put a 40% glycol mix in here, put the name, put the pH that you left it at, put the date that you put it in there. So if you go back there two years later, another technician goes back, he says, well, you know, what's in the system? I don't want to just drain it out and start over until I know what's happened. And 
you know, if you come up to a system with an unknown fluid, this was one of the questions, what if I come up to a system that has glycol and I have no idea what the guy before me put in there? Can I put other glycol? Can I mix glycols in there? Well, yes and no. You can actually blend different uh, propylene glycols, the PGs, without a problem. The problem that you might have is somebody put an ethylene glycol in there before you, an EG glycol, and now you go back and you mix another PG glycol with that. The two of them will mix together and they'll go through the system and they'll be an antifreeze fine, but you'll end up with an unknown toxicity because the EG is going to have a higher toxicity than the PG, so you kind of got a little bit of a witch's brew in there. So if you don't know what somebody else put in there and you want to be sure that you do it right, you know, unfortunately, you're probably going to have to drain it out and start over. I always like to leave a container of the fluid that I use behind, you know, an empty one with the label on it. And it, actually, when I do a solar system, I'll put the pressure relief valve discharge tube right down in that empty container for two reasons. If it ever pops off, I save the fluid, number one. I don't make a mess on the floor. And also, I've got the container showing me or the next guy what kind of fluid went in there the first time so we can make sure that he puts the same or similar fluid um, back into the system. Uh, there's the fluid that we offer. Again, I talked about this. We only have in five-gallon containers. We can ship that out to you if you want a good quality, uh, a high temperature, uh, good um, inhibitor package glycol. We uh, we have it in that five-gallon container in green. Um, how much late am I here, Mark? I'm a couple minutes. I have a few more slides if you can hang in there with me. It looks like a lot of the people are staying on, so I'll keep going here. So this is a, an example of a, a little. Uh, drawing that uh, Cleffy Italy put together for us of what's going on inside a heat exchanger in a boiler. So if you look at this over here, this is in fact the, the slide that Jim Paling had. He had temperatures up over 2600 degree flame temperatures on some of the boilers here. So this is your burn, uh, burner, your flame temperature. This is your metal. And now if this happens to be a Modcon boiler, that might be a few thousands of thickness of metal that's between this high intensity flame and this being your fluid, your water, your glycol, your blender, whatever you put in your system. So the failure mechanism when you get a pinhole in a boiler or a, a component, an expansion tank or whatever, is you'll get a scale buildup like this here and it creates this hot spot. So now what happens is when this heat's trying to get through to this water, you've actually put a little bit of an insulation layer in there and that's where you're going to overheat that metal. And that's where when you see a boiler that's got a pinhole in it, probably on the other side of that pinhole, if you were to take a, a you know, bandsaw and cut that in half, you would see a big a scale buildup on the other side of it. And this kind of gives you a little example of the, uh, the temperatures that you can expect to see here. And this also shows a good example. When you heat water, you're going to drive these little micro bubbles out of solution. So if you were to put a, a pan on your stove tonight when you go home and put, fill it up with water and turn the burner on, you would see these little bubbles rise up out of that pan. And that's this little um, air that's entrained in that fluid that's being driven out as you increase the temperature of it. And that's why we always want to put a good air separator, a micro bubble type air separator like a disc scale right at the boiler. So as these little bubbles are being formed every time that boiler fire kicks on, I want to grab and get these bubbles out of the system before they get out into my uh, <clears throat> in my components and, and cause an, an air lock or cause a noise problem. So this is an ongoing thing. This is going to happen anytime that you heat and cool water. You're going to, uh, the water is going to reabsorb any air that was left or dissolved uh, um, um, air that's in that system every time the water cools down and every time you turn this burner back on and heat it up you're going to drive this air back out of solution so I need to be able to catch it and grab it and get it out of the system so it doesn't um, uh, doesn't cause problems there's the um, <clears throat> excuse me the hydrofill cart that we offer now from Calafi and basically this is a de, um, deionizer demineralizer is about the same thing so there's a resin bed in here that's got some uh, uh, media in it that's got both a positive and negative charge. It's actually a biased uh, bag of resin in there. So we're going to hook a hose on the bottom of this. Uh, we're going to flow water through there and there happens to be a TDS meter at the top. So I know the water that's coming out of there is going to meet the TDS that you um, that you're trying to get to for your uh, your boiler spec. Now one of the um, what was the question I had? Oh, one of the questions that came in a couple questions about this. What about the low water cutoff probes that we use that use a probe style low water cutoff? Don't they need to have a little bit of conductivity left in the water so those can read? And yes, you're exactly right, they do. And so what we did in our uh, lab there in Milwaukee um, a year or so ago when we uh, were developing this cart is we bought, I think, five or six different brands of low water cutoff probe types and we put them in the water that as it came out of this and we measured the TDS of the water and we found 
if you get down below about what do we have? I think about 12 on the mark, if you remember exactly, about 10 or 12 uh, ppm on the TDS meter, those low water probes wouldn't make anymore because there wasn't enough conductivity. So you don't want to put water that's been stripped completely of everything, get it too pure because you're not going to have the conductivity. Now, what we found is even if you take the water out of here down at a low parts per million, let's say you got it down to five parts per million, put it in the system, what we found within sometimes hours or within the first day, it's gonna pull some of the metal, some of the brass or copper, something out of this, uh, maybe the iron body here, and it's gonna buffer that uh, that number back up a little bit uh, just from what it pulls out of the system. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you're concerned right out the get-go, you again, you can put a pH booster to boost that up if you wanna make sure when you leave the job that you've got your, uh, your conductivity up high enough uh, to make sure that your low water probes aren't gonna um, air out on you and kick off your system. So, yeah, you do have to pay attention to those uh, uh, low water probe type of. Uh, hey, Bob, uh, um, this is Mark. The, the uh, several manufacturers of low water cutoffs that we tested with using demineralized water, it was 10 parts per million that was pretty much the common cut in and cut out point where those conductivity type probe low water cutoffs work. Well, uh, yeah. So, um, and it's a good point that you said that uh, the demineralizer, um, whether it's Cleffy or any other brand in the marketplace that's used in mixed bed media, is going to take the water, strip it out, and, and the um, and the and the TDS is going to be basically zero. Conductivity is gone. And conductivity is gone. But uh, with the conductivity uh, down, as well as uh, with the pH being uh, somewhat lowered. No. Any metals in the system are going to are going to are going to end up reacting with the water, and what will happen is two things in any hydronic system: is your pH is going to tend to want to drift back up, and well, I think the last slide you have in this will show a little bit about how that happens, mm -hmm. and it typically will stabilize somewhere in the range of eight, the range that just about every boiler manufacturer, whether it's stainless steel or aluminum, will say. Uh, they're happy with, so yep. or, or even a chiller. And the other thing that happens is that the, the TDS, which is how those conductivity meters work off of, that also rises. And as you'll see in that German VDI standard or the Swiss standard, typically uh, a range of TDS that all systems tend to stabilize to over time is between 30 and 60 parts per million or or measured in conductivity 50 to 100 microsiemens per centimeter. So oh, yeah. the bottom line there is basically even with demineralized water, you're going to have no problem with your low water uh, cutoff. We had a couple of issues where uh, people had uh, had a problem, but they just add, added just a little bit of uh, tap water and the conductivity just went quickly up to where the, the low water cutoffs work perfectly. Yeah, the day they were there, they wanted to get that back up so they didn't walk away from it questionable if it's right on the borderline. So yeah, yeah. it's gonna get there by itself, but if you wanna make sure before you leave, yeah, just blend in a little of the water that's on the job site and, and bring that up a little bit. And, right, uh, when you right. Walk away. Yeah, thanks. Right, but the reason why the pH even drops is that when you come out of a demineralizer is that uh, the water is looking for, uh, it's looking for carbon dioxide. And if you are, if you if you um, if you take a long time to fill your system up, that demineralized water has time to absorb carbon dioxide and create a, a slight acid called carbonic acid, and your pH yep. will drop down a little bit. And as a result, those systems will see a little bit of a drop in pH when they fill their systems up. Other systems that just really race the water through, purge all the air ahead, there's no chance for that reaction to take place. And thus, their pH is going to be more like a neutral pH that you'd find in any any kind of water. Great. Well, thanks for helping me out with that. Yeah, I think I, just a few more here. I think I just kind of show a little bit of how our uh, example, the, the resin that's inside of our, our hydrofoil cart that I just showed you in that previous slide. So you can see what we do there is we've got some positive and some negatives. Uh, in there, so we're going to pull everything that's in that very first bubble that I showed you at one of the first slides where we had some browns and some blues in that bubble. Uh, by putting it through this type of resin, we're going to uh, pull it out, and there's kind of the uh, uh, graphic of what's happening. So there's your water with all the <clears throat> 
losing my voice after three days of talking here. There's all the different things. Some of those you might recognize the calciums and the different minerals that are in there. Some of those are scaling minerals. Uh, so there, as you can see, the cation, the positive charge there is pulling out the opposites, and then you've got the opposite charge there. So by the time you go through the multiple um, resin media that we've got in there, you're going to end up with pretty much H2O down at the bottom. You end up with pure water. Hey, Bobby, this is a good point. There are a few questions we're addressing this particular issue about contaminants in the water. Uh, when you use a demineralizer uh, such as this, as mixed bed media, it's going to, any mineral that's in solution, it, it's going to pull it out, whether it's iron or manganese yep. or calcium or magne, uh, and, yeah. and, and, and as a result, result in uh, uh, pure, pure water. And, and mineral minerals are basically they deionize, um, but when it comes to um, uh, additives to water that are not mineral based and are instead carbon based, for example, glycol, ethanol, and those type of those do not ionize, and as a re, uh, those those don't ionize, and as a result. They would not get pulled out of out of, out of solution, but uh, additives that typically are put into glycol to as uh, stabilizers will ionize and a demineralize demineralizer will pull them out of solution. So a question that came in is, can I use a demineralizer that has a, a, a on a system that has glycol and um, and and run it through the demineralizer? And you, you could do that but you'd just be stripping out all of the inhibitors out of your glycol and then therefore rendering it uh, vulnerable to um, being broken down and no longer freeze protection. Yeah, and I, like you say, why would you do that? Because now you've just taken your glycol and, and destroyed your glycol for the purpose of getting your water fixed. It's better, you know, start over, just drain it all out and, right. and start from square one with a clean system, with the right water, with the right glycol. It, it's hard to go back and fix systems, especially when you don't know exactly what's going on or what's happened over yeah. the past. So, Another you know, question that came in, Bob, on this is that, well, how about, how about if my city water has chlorine, chlorine in it? Um, what will happen? Um, well, we saw from an earlier slide that if left un well, typically water coming from a system, uh, municipal water supply with chlorine, they're they're governed by the national um, safety standards that have that chlorinated uh, content uh, to a minimum level. And I think I saw that stainless steel boiler manufacturer spec that you showed a few slides back that said chlorine should be kept below five uh, parts per million or five yep. milligrams per liter. And yep. I think that is that 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 is higher than what um, the municipal city water will allow their water to get to. Uh, so it shouldn't be an issue, even though you might be able to taste it. Um, cl chlorides are different, though. Chlorides is not chlorine. Chlorides are uh, a little bit more ag aggressive and and, um, and and so and it's and they do ionize. So um, Boiler manufacturers sometime will have a separate spec for how much chloride concentration could be in a, in, a, in water for their boiler to be protected. And it seems that the chlorides are the most concerned of people that make stainless steel, both indirect water heaters and boilers. That's the number that seems to make them a little bit nervous, and they usually have a pretty tight spec on it. So if you have, I think even the stainless steel water heaters you buy now will have that spec right on the label on the side, make sure that the chloride levels are below this. Now, to know if you've got chloride levels above that, you kind of need a meter that tests for that specifically, because in your TDS, you could have chlorides, but it could be, you know, it could be the calcium, it could be magnesium, it could be any of the other things in this bubble that are causing that TDS meter. Uh, it isn't going to tell you what these different things are. So if you need to know the chlorides, and I looked into those, it gets to be a little bit more expensive of a test to, uh, mm -hmm. to test for chloride levels. So I think that example that you showed earlier, though, that uh, test report uh, d does spell out all of those uh, critical type of uh, contaminants, yep. chlorides being one of them. Yep. And I remember that, that that water was around 24 parts per million chloride. Uh, that, that's starting to get to be a little bit on the high side. Um, that might have been groundwater based. I'm not quite sure. Mostly, most municipal water. Uh, the chlorides and the nitrates and sulfates will typically be very, very low. And, 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 and as a rule, as it relates to corrosion, they're typically pretty good without having to really treat them uh, for, the, for the most part, yeah. with one exception. Many municipal water supplies will pull their water out of aquifers. And even though the chemicals contaminants might be low, such as chlorides and, and the like, the magnesium and calcium could, could be high. 
So you could have no problem with the exception of scaling. And uh, we've seen that with failed heat exchangers that got sent to us photographs that were from city water. Uh, yeah. Everything seemed to be good with the exception that they had um, hard water. So, yeah, the scaling minerals were still in there. But I guess my point is that for you to check for just chlorides at a job site, probably you're going to have to send it like that we showed you earlier to a lab that has the equipment to do that, unless you're going to invest in that and learn how to use it and learn how to calibrate it. But yeah, yeah just to break the chloride level out of your water, unless you get a report from uh, you know the city that uh, tested that, you know the meters I showed you today aren't going to tell you what the chloride level is. So um, if that's a specific number that you want to uh, know, you're going to have to have that tested for that. Yep. Yep. All right. So uh, I just it shows kind of how our cart works. So you can just um, uh, if you have valves like this, where you can put it in one side of the valve, have an isolation valve between the fill and the purge, and just put it in there. And the, until you're sure that you've got, you know, again, check the TDS meter on the top of our cart going in, check the TDS of that water that's coming out the other side. And when it gets to the same TDS, you know that you've flushed all the old water out, that you've got it completely filled with the uh, the water that's gone through the uh, hydro uh, fill cart there and got the TDS pulled down. Bob, if you want to advance this, uh, keep keep going on this. There's some, in, uh, two or three questions came in that are related to pH. And I'll ask, I'll recite the question, um, just so that we can answer it on this slide to some degree. Um, okay. One question is, uh, do I have an issue with using reclaimed water uh, for my hydronic system? And I'm, I'm assuming like rainwater or something that got collected from, you know, perhaps uh, roof runoff or what have you. Um, and another question related uh, to this slide would be, um, uh, my my natural water in my area has a pH, you know, somewhere in that five range, which is pretty acidic. Uh, yeah. Is it is it good for my stainless steel boiler? Well, the answer to that question is in both those cases. Uh, in the case obviously when you got water that's getting pulled out of your municipal supply or out of your ground, it's got pH five, which isn't untypical, especially up in mountain areas. Um, that by itself is uh, it, it is uh, is a problem for sure in an open system, uh, low pH. Um, if, you have, if you collect rain, reclaimed rain, uh, like say in a rain barrel or some other, it also, just like the raindrops themselves, is gonna have a pH somewhere in that five and a half range. And if you had pH of five or five and a half in a closed hydronic system for any sustained length of time, that's pretty aggressive and it would cause problem not only on your stainless steel heat exchanger, it would first cause a problem on your less strong metals such as your irons and your steels and your coppers before stainless steel. So the stainless is the least of your, of your concerns. But what happens in a, a closed hydronic system is different than what might happen, what happens in an open system if you have low pH. And here's an example. So let's say you have low pH to begin with, like say coming out of your demineralizer or reclaimed rainwater that you got put into your system, however it started off is low, it's temporary. Because what happens in a, a hydronic system is that you see as in, a, as in the rain barrel example, the water, H2O, it reacts with carbon dioxide and it creates this thing called H2CO3, which is um, uh, carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid dissociates to yes to bicarbonate and and hydrogen, and those positive charges on the hydrogen. Remember the definition of uh, P pH is the uh, increase in uh, hydrogen uh, ionic uh, activity versus hydroxide. That causes your your pH to drop. That's what's that's that's what's happening with rain as an example. However, in a in a boiler, what happens and I skip to all the equations here, but basically when you heat up carbonic acid, it reacts with H2O and oxygen and heat, creating carbonic acid. And it basically uh, increases, you can see that second one, your hydroxide. So your pH then starts to, as a result of driving off uh, hydrogen, starts to uh, increase your pH back, not only to six or seven, but as we indicated, typically around eight is cited on most systems. And the hot, uh, there's a lot of factors, but the, the hotter your system is, the quicker it gets to that pH level of like a neutral eight. So the answer to the question, should I be concerned about that low pH in my, in my hydronic system, typically is no, because over time that pH is gonna come up into that 
kind of safe zone that all metals like that we call it the happy zone of say 7.5 to 8. But the, the key is to test it you know you we're, don't assume that it's going to get there go back in a week if you have to and test it make sure that it did come up and if it didn't enough to you know meet the spec of the boiler then you can put a booster in there but from our experience and what Mark says and with the German standard and everything else we've read and people we've talked to and actually our own test and we put a, some in Kevin's house out there and we've been watching and monitoring that we put the uh, you know through the hydrofill and we filled that and we watched what how his waters change over the past couple of I guess years now and uh, we know that to be um, to be true so well and you, you can if you if you don't want to wait around and wait for it naturally to come up to uh, say say you want eight uh, you know, different manufacturers have pH boosters. I think you yeah. showed one pH yeah. up, you know, yeah. Romar or Sentinel. And yeah. so you can you can force it that way, and the the manufacturer will give you the ratio of how much you want to put in to get yeah. to the certain pH, and then it'll, then then you're good. Um, it, it's going it's gonna already be at that uh, level that it ultimately would get to. And so um, there's ways of doing that if you want to make sure your pH is going to get to the range that you quickly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, hopefully everybody got um, some good information out of this and uh, any other questions or anything Mark before we we wrap it up here there was one that maybe someone knows and I'm not quite sure the question and maybe we can end the webinar on this and it might be a little bit out of trivia and the question is um, why would water from warm water pipes freeze quicker than water from cold water pipes you know, and I've seen that debated both ways, and I don't, and I don't know that I have an opinion. I've heard that if you drive some of the gases out of there, you know, there's less insulation between the water and the wall of the pipe, and it freezes quicker. I've heard that with ice cubes, you know, use hot water in your ice cubes, will uh, freeze not only quicker but cleaner because you've taken some of those uh, dissolved gases out of there by heating it. So I don't know if that's a wise tale or, you know. I guess you know you could find two engineers that could argue that to the end of the time as far as which is right, but. Uh, do you have an opinion? I, I kind of well, think it's, I, it's, it's it just right. came in, and I, I haven't thought about it. Maybe one of the readers that are more chemically minded, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that if you took two glasses of water, and one glass you put salt in it, and you put them both in the freezer, which one's going to freeze first? Well, yeah, definitely the salt's going to, you know, uh, slow it down. Okay, the one without salt's going to freeze first, right? That's not um, right. because the other one has. Uh, minerals dissolved in it called right. uh, salt in this case yep. when you're looking at water going through, in a house say into a into a it splits off and one goes into your hot water heater and the other one goes out to your cold water pipes the difference between the two is your hot water heater if there's any if there's any uh, it's going to want to do what it's going to want to it could pull some calcium and magnesium out of solution just by creating just a little bit of scale buildup. And as a result, your conductivity is gonna go down. And so relatively speaking, your water, cold water would have high, higher mineral content. And as a result, it would be last to freeze, assuming they both cool down to the same temperature and then you, then you tested the freeze point. That's my theory, but someone else might be able to give a better answer. Well, and there you have the classic example of uh, an opinion from an engineer and a plumber. So Mark <laughs> takes a little deeper thought process there, but again, I'm not convinced one way or another that, uh, and how hot a water and, and how much quicker, and you know, how do you know that, you know, go crazy with that uh, question, but uh, yeah, a fun way to end up. And um, uh, yeah, we'll get through the questions that came in today. I see a couple of them on my, uh, I opened up my question uh, box here, but thanks again, everybody. and. Uh, uh, we'll see you again soon.